So let's start. Good evening, good evening, everybody. Um, you know, this is our Austrian Economic Monthly, the event that we started last year, almost one year ago. Um, we started actually one year ago with the European Resource Bank. Since we couldn't host it in Rome, we decided to get together uh, every month on a topic. And then we transformed that into the Austrian Economic Monthly. And ever since uh, every last Thursday of the month at six o'clock, we meet no matter what happens out there. And actually we went through a pandemic and we're still here, despite the pandemic is still here with us, but it seems that vaccines are working well, uh, despite all the difficulties we are aware and we're familiar with. And uh, somehow, despite the variants, things are slowly but progressively getting better. In some countries they did great, think about Israel, the UK as well, the United States, Europe is a bit behind and some countries in Europe are doing so and so some are faster some are slower but it seems we're catching up one of the big challenges is in the rest of the world how to speed up the vaccination process and some people guess who just uh, suggested to get away with or take away the ip the intellectual property the patents of the vaccine and let's see whether this is a wise uh, uh, suggestion or not, but let's start with our guests, as I said, and I wanna introduce them again. One is Philip Steven, second it's Keith Miles, and then with Barbara. I would like to start with our queen, Barbara. Barbara, I first have to make a, a, a negative comment, and I know this is the worst way to start, but it's because of your fault. You define yourself as the libertarian lady or woman. Why defining yourself a woman? I mean, you're just an individual. You don't need to call yourself a woman. You just make this, feminist happy now and uh, you just you say you are a libertarian or a liberal or whatever why a, a woman okay you just a person anyway but we forget about that that's the worst way to start but i needed to provoke you uh barbara what's happening with vaccines in europe is this working well and uh, is this bringing us back to normality and I wanted to keep this question for the end, so I will change somehow my agenda, but guys, don't worry, the question will remain the same as we agreed. But do we need a patent to go back to, you know, to real life or normal life, Barbara? Well, first of all, um, I'm an individual, a libertarian individual, and this title was, I was promoted this title by our American friends. So, um, blame it to them but you as an italian should actually know how to deal with ladies uh just for you, for you. That well, barbara back. sorry yesterday president president biden just said uh vice president lady and you know it was in the u.s a big deal about this uh, his starting of the speech so let's say and now madame uh, barbara you can go <laughs> Mille grazie, <laughs> veramente. Uh, but coming back to your question, well, IP rights are uh, very, very truly important to a successful society, to a growing society. There's a precondition. It's property rights, protecting property rights. Without property rights, we wouldn't be anywhere. And we've grown out of, um, or our, our countries have grown out of poverty once we have uh, defined those. And you as an, as an Italian, knowing Roman law, you know exactly where, what I'm talking about. But uh, coming to the very beginning of this debate, um, of course, we see different regions have used very different approaches in their vaccine rollout and, and sadly our region in Europe uh, probably has not been especially um, successful in, in rolling out this process. I mean they forgot that most of the vaccines actually were have been produced on the continent uh, but the rollout the management of this uh, was a no-go for the bureaucratic system and uh, in other parts of the world uh, this uh, system has picked up steam and in the recent weeks and uh, we are still lagging behind um, and uh, everybody knows about the numbers but you know friends in in the in in great britain are are all vaccined. If you are a 40 year old and you don't ha and you haven't received your, vac uh, your, your first shot, uh, people look at you kind of strange. Uh, whereas in, in Austria, my home country, uh, the 60 years, the 60 plus year olds are now uh, in turn. Um, and you already mentioned at the beginning, Israel, UK and the US have really done a great job on that. So 
actually the commission has messed up um, on the strategy from the very from the very start i mean per purchasing the vaccines too late trying to negotiate the best price to make it cheaper forgetting the consequences i mean one week of lockdown costs as much more than uh, a, a shot that would be one euro more expensive and this is what has not been considered and uh, besides that uh, as i mentioned already most of those have been produced in most of those vaccines are, are produced in europe so one should think that you would deal with your partner companies uh, in the right way and the point is that instead of admitting mistakes that have happened or that they might have made, uh, they, they started endless infights, for example, the, with AstraZeneca, uh, which had their shipping problems and others, uh, they, they just forgot about what is the target, getting the vaccine on the market to the citizen and not uh, um, doing this in a, in a central planned organization, let the markets work. Um, and the other idea you already mentioned, and this is part of the question, is whether uh, we should now uh, eliminate the intellectual property rights for those vaccines uh, or wh whatever for any uh, pharmaceutical product. And Phil and Keith also, we have always been arguing that property rights and intellectual property rights, especially also in medicine, are very important because uh, politicians tend to forget, or sometimes bureaucrats as well, tend to forget how much investment is needed to get a product on the market, how much research is needed, how much research needs to be done. And um, uh, this, uh, this is just not fair. Uh, to uh, to steal the property from others, just to, to make sure that you have this uh, war warlike um, economy going, and more so abolishing IP rights now would send a signal to all private businesses in the world: never do something good for the world again, because governments might take uh, take the rewards away from you. So this is not totally not pro-market capitalism. It's, it's governments taking away properties from free enterprise. And these vaccine companies are the main, um, are the main story here in reality. The COVID vaccines are a success because how fast they proceeded uh, is unbelievable. If you had planned it, it would not have worked. So those innovators have come up with multiple effective vaccines within just a few months. And uh, has this ever happened before in, in, in this speed? I don't think so. And if it was not for government regulations, we might have had vaccines much faster already. Uh, remember the Moderna vaccine was already discovered back in January, 2019. And within two days, within two days of research, and then it took another 11 months of tests, bureaucratic hurdles, and sim uh, just to be authorized. In this time span, of course, we need to make sure that everything is safe. I fully understand that, but one could probably speed up the process. So and my final point is, um, you know, we should focus um, on the story of free enterprise. Uh, and we should focus on um, vaccinating as many people and as fast as possible and hold those accountable, accountable who are responsible for messing up with the procurement. Then, and then we can return to normality. And this is exactly your question. So, of course, uh, if politicians let us return to our normal life instead of, you know, the freedoms that we were enjoying before, um, I don't think this will be possible because we have been restricted for over a year, for more than a year now and people are being uh, dealt uh, not equally and this is the next problem and most important and I think we should discuss this probably in my in the second round the economic destruction that we have seen by cutting the supply chains uh, by locking people in and by not allowing them to be productive. Just, you know, those home office things that we've seen in the service industry um, reduce in many cases, not in all, 
There might be there are many exceptions, but in many cases we see a lack of productivity, and uh, Europe definitely needs to be competitive again. And we have been we have not been as competitive before COVID, and now with what has happened, we're even in a in a worse uh, in a worse situation. So the return to normal with vaccines, yes, but it should have been faster. And of course, we will we probably will never uh, be without a vaccine in this situation with COVID and all these variations. Thanks, uh, thanks, Barbara. Thank you very much. You, you brought on the table very, very many uh, topics, but as we know, the issue around vaccine is incredibly uh, vast. Keith, let me come to you and thank you for being here. You have 40 years experience as a chartered accountant. You've been working with many businesses. Uh, and I know you have a, a great knowledge you want to share with us. Barbara touched upon several points, uh, but I want to keep some of them specifically for the next speaker being, uh, being Philip. Uh, I want to focus more on how Europe initially has dealt uh, with, uh, with vaccines, because Europe has been talking with pharmaceutical companies for a while, but then as Barbara said, the way the negotiation went on was very different from what Israel, UK, or other countries did. Uh, but to add more to what Barbara said, the, the approach was, you are bad companies speculating over Europe. We need to negotiate over the price. Why, while other countries like Israel have brought the discussion on other, uh, uh, other uh, factors and aspects. Is there any comment you have or you want to add to what Barbara said to explain why Europe has been so slow? Well, I think um, uh, perhaps I should say, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Austrian economics. And so uh, I, uh, I think back to von Mises and uh, Berm, Barwerk and uh, Menger and uh, of course Hayek. And, and the lesson from all of them, uh, well, two of the key lessons was central planning does not work. It doesn't work as well as the free market. And of course the procurement program of the EU fundamentally started from the idea of we're going to have a central plan. Everyone's going to subscribe to the central plan and we'll know what they want. This was the first big mistake. Uh, the second uh, big mistake, which I think was more uh, Berm Barberg, who, who introduced the idea into economics, the time was actually a vital concept. It's not just the nuts and bolts of, uh, of the market, but it's also time. Time has a value. And therefore, uh, I think the fact that the the young lady that was put in charge of the, uh, the British um, program, a lady called Kate Bingham, a uh, very bright uh, uh, young woman, not, not so young now, but a bright woman, who, uh, who actually was a biochemist, so she understood the, the industry. She is now a venture capitalist, so she understood the investment and she understood the need to get moving quickly because uh, the investment chain leading to uh, production and procurement and, and logistics and so on just doesn't occur overnight. Therefore, if you've got an emergency, the quicker you take decisions, don't worry so much about price, worry about getting the thing moving very quickly. And that was a key difference, I think. The, the second key difference, which applies to uh, the US, and to particularly to Israel, but also to the UK, is the point that the, the Austrian economist said that demand comes from the consumer. It is, it is not led by production, it's the, the causal agent is the consumer. And in this case, the consumer, you could either say were the nations or the citizens of the nations. And um, unfortunately, the bureaucrats in Brussels were not uh, were not uh, in a position to respect that demand. They were acting like a uh, ghost plan in Moscow. And, and therefore they thought about price. They thought they had plenty of time to decide these things. Uh, uh, and, and that was a, a fatal, a really fatal mistake. 
I think they all should go on an Austrian economics training plan to understand the, how, the, how these things work. The, uh, whereas if you take the US and the UK, there's no doubt that uh, the democratic systems where have what, with all their benefits and faults, they're very close to the citizen. And Israel in particular is very close to the citizen and they have an inbuilt, uh, uh, how should I put it, an, an inbuilt uh, reaction to protect their citizen because of the nature of their history. And, and also the, the, the political systems in, in, the, in the UK and the US are very close to the, to the idea that the, the first duty of an elected politician is the defense of the citizens. That's the defense against external enemies. The defense uh, against uh, internal crime, but also the defense in this case of the citizens' health. So that is somehow, without thinking about it, they, their reaction is we better get on with this fast. Even if we make mistakes, we'll correct them as we go along. So you then ran up against, uh, in, in Brussels, the, uh, uh, the um, you know, the bureaucrat never makes mistakes. You remember that, 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 that book by Solzhenitsyn, which ended up with the commissar saying, we never make mistakes. So, so they couldn't admit to, for example, that they had made mistakes. So therefore they, they look to blame someone. So when they blame someone uh, and, and the hype up uh, that uh, the AstraZeneca is very dangerous, dangerous for old people, first of all, then it's dangerous for young people. <laughs> Uh, they, that information going out into the marketplace in a Hayekian sort of way, it gets gets blown up. So we've got the state now where there, there are actually uh, warehouses full of AstraZeneca uh, vaccines sitting in Holland. That's, that's completely ridiculous. But but for Mises and um, Barwerk and, and, and Menger, they, but they would say that's logical because they cannot manage the distribution. It has to be managed on a demand basis. Then you get the other reaction. The places that really uh, want to defend their citizens and support their citizens, whether it's Orban in, um, in Hungary or, or I hear Austria is also looking at it or, or the Slovaks, they're looking to buy from Russia because they're saying we have to defend our citizens. Even if we don't think uh, we don't trust it as much as an American vaccine or a British vaccine or a German vaccine. We got to get it. We got to get it. So, so the whole thing has become chaotic, and yet it's all explainable if you if you read the the uh, Austrian school classics. Um, I don't know what else I can say. You know the. Uh, Clearly, the fast. Oh, Kit, the Kit, let's, uh, Kit, let's stop here for a moment and sorry to interrupt you, but uh, you touched upon your starting point was about time. And yeah. of course, here it was a matter of time. And Barbara has underlined importantly how, in less than nine months, and Barbara talked. Now, were able to get the first uh, the first uh, shots. A new technology has been uh, uh, introduced, and that's incredibly important. But I want to turn to Philip because Philip is the executive director of the Geneva Network. He has specialized focus and work for many years on intellectual property. And one of the provocation right now is, first of all, this is not a usual uh, 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 disease or sickness. This is a pandemic. It concerns the entire world. And therefore, we have these, or we owe, as you say in England, uh, to vaccinate a lot of people that do not have resources, do not have physical, monetary, financial resources to get to the vaccine. So one of the idea is to create this community, the COVAX and so on. But one of the ideas is in order to speed up this process of production and distribution, we should basically give, I don't know whoever, but companies around the world the chance to copy the vaccine and therefore taking away the patent and give anybody basically the opportunity to reproduce the vaccine without paying any royalty. In other words, let's swap away 
the uh, patents. And this is one of the proposals that's coming from Europe, also somebody in the US and in many countries. If I think about Italy every day, every day, I swear there is a discussion around this. We should take away the patent in order to allow people in India, look what happened in India. If there's no patent, we will be able to produce more vaccines and distribute them. Philip, I know that you disagree with this approach. Can you explain us what is wrong with what people emotionally think is the wise approach, but you say it's not wise? Uh, thanks, Pietro. Yeah, it's a really complicated issue, but it it's a, a dichotomy that's been playing out for, for decades now. There's um, most of the academia uh, and, and NGO land uh, oppose intellectual property rights, particularly in healthcare, and they have done for, for decades. Um, and the, the COVID situation is simply another front in, a, in an ongoing war that's being waged uh, intellectually for, for decades. So let me just start by stay, saying that so far in this pandemic, the opponents of intellectual property rights have been proven wrong. If you cast your mind back to about a year ago, there was uh, massive campaigns by Oxfam, Médecins Sans Frontières, various Nobel laureates, um, ex-politicians, calling for a suspension of IP rights because they thought it would block research and development, uh, that it would stop scientists from sharing information, from collaborating, uh, and, and would delay the, the development of vaccines for, to, to defeat COVID. And in reality, as we all know, the, the exact opposite has happened. We've, we've got four, um, four vaccines in uh, marketed and approved by um, stringent regulatory authorities in the US and Europe. Uh, and there's a nine or 10 coming up behind. So actually we have, you know, we're spoiled for choice. The, the IP system has delivered uh, in record time, multiple vaccines, uh, all highly effective. Um, the, the data coming out shows that these vaccines are surpassing even the expectations of their developers, which is great news for all of us. Um, but if we'd listened to the opponents of, of IP, we probably wouldn't be in this situation because there would be no incentive for the, um, for the developers of the vaccine vaccines to collaborate because IP uh, counterintuitively um, allows people to cooperate. It's characterized as something that stops people from sharing and cooperating. But if you have legal certainty that your property can be shared with potential rivals or comp potential competitors without them running away with it and using it for their own advantage, it means you can enter into, into research partnerships, into manufacturing partnerships, which is what we saw. The most obvious example being Pfizer and, and BioNTech, who collaborated together with BioNTech's idea, and Pfizer had the resources to develop it into, and take it through clinical trials and so on. Um, but there's only having a clear agreement of who owns the IP and what, what how it's shared out, how it's priced, uh, how it's manufactured, all encapsulated within agreements that can only be protected by intellectual property rights. That's what's enabled that vaccine to, to turn up so quickly. Now, so they're proven wrong at the beginning of the pandemic about research and development. Now the debate has shifted on to, yeah, well, the, you know, we need more vaccines rapidly. There's huge supply issues um, in Europe, in India, and so on and so forth. Um, so that the, the argument is that, yes, they should suspend all IP, not just patents, but also copyright, trademarks, any, literally anything to do with, with COVID um, health technologies, um, and, and suspend those for the time being to allow all comers to manufacture um, manufacture the vaccines. Uh, I, I suppose it sounds plausible in principle, but the reality is um, I'm not sure this would actually achieve anything because most uh, COVID um, knowledge is not encapsulated in patents, unlike normal medicines, but vaccines, it's all about know-how. Um, so it's how you make them, how the processes required to manufacture vaccines are highly technical and are not normally written down in patents. They're normally in two or three employees brain <laughs> um, and they're protected by trade secrets or non-disclosure agreements or other, other forms of contract, which um, keep that, that quite valuable information safe. So if you were to suspend patents, there, there's no legal uh, route to, to getting this know-how uh, to all the companies that need it in India or, or wherever. Um, so what you'd have is uh, you'd have this global IP waiver 
um, and, and very little would happen. If, even if companies were able to get hold of that know-how, they'd, they'd then have to set up their, their vaccine manufacturing plants from scratch. They'd have to identify other suppliers, resources, um, and enter into highly complicated and technical manufacturing processes of which only a few companies or facilities, particularly for the more modern mRNA vaccines, um, only exist in the world. So you wouldn't actually increase the, the, the overall supply of vaccines in my view. Um, the approach that's being taken currently, which I think is the correct one, um, although understandably is taking a while to play out because you, you're trying to produce five to six billion doses in a year, not an easy, not difficult, not an easy feat, um, is through licensing. So the owners of the IP are entering into licensing agreements with other manufacturers in other parts of the world. So AstraZeneca notably has entered into licensing deals with um, mainly in India, but also in Russia, Korea, Ch Japan, China, um, Brazil, uh, with the goal of, of producing uh, around a billion to two billion doses in, in a year. Um, but the IP rights allow them to collect, to cooperate and to share that um, very valuable information know-how and ensure that the, the vaccines are being manufactured to the correct standard um, and ensure that uh, supply chains will be, will be kept running. And obviously there's been a few bottlenecks and supply issues, but I suspect we'd find a much worse situation if um, you suddenly have all kinds of companies scrambling around for what is a finite set of resources. So I think the current approach of IP licensing um, is the best one. Uh, I, I, current research coming out of Duke University anticipates that there will be enough doses to, to vaccinate, vaccinate all adults in the world by the end of or the middle of next year. Um, um, which is uh I think. Philip, sorry to interrupt. I also dropped the line here. Oh. Something has happened to, to my internet, but uh, I just missed a few seconds of, of what you were saying. Uh, I all agree, I, I agree entirely with what you said, but you know, one day I was in a, in a debate like the one we're having here today. And by the way, this is the Austrian Economics Monthly and thank you for joining us here on Zoom, but particularly uh, on Facebook, we are recording. So this event will be, will remain with us on the, uh, Austrian Economic Center website, so you can watch it whenever you want. You can spread this, so please take the speeches by our, the talks by our two great, great guests and just spread them around because they're very relevant what they're saying. Uh, but Philip, coming back to you, and, and, and I will go the way around to Keith and then to Barbara to end with our debate, unless there were questions. Um, I was in, in a debate, as I was saying, and one, one of the speaker turned to me and he said, but you know, companies like Pfizer, BioNTech and some others got many public funds. So now they must give back. And I had to tell you, I found myself in trouble at the beginning. And of course I found an, a solution to that question. But what is your point? Should we defend IP, but at the same time companies are enjoying some public funds? Um, well, it's an interesting question, I think. I think that boils down to an accusation of, of price gouging or hoarding of resources, um, which I suppose is, is a plausible accusation, but it's not actually happening in this case. Um, so Pfizer, um, although it's making a profit on its vaccines, is charging quite reasonable prices, I think. Um, AstraZeneca is, uh, is charging non-profit prices. Um, so it, that the accusation of, of hoarding or price gouging, I, do, I think don't stand. And this was a point I forgot to make earlier on. Um, the IP system is delivering a, a real competitive market in, in COVID vaccines. So you have four ones that you or I'd be happy to take on the market. You've got nine or 10 coming up uh, over the next few months. So you're gonna have you know, a good dozen or 12 um, vaccines competing with each other. So the opportunity for, for price gouging uh, all the accusations that normally go against patented medicines are just not going to come to pass. The prices are going to be kept low through competitive pressures um, and supply as well. Because if you know, as ever, as anyone knows, if there's an opportunity to make some money, supply will will increase. And I think this decentralized approach is definitely the best one, and it, it is delivered. I mean, the the if you look back a year ago at, at um, and imagine we'd be having this argument about how to um, distribute vaccines this soon after the pandemic begun, I think we'd, 
we'd be thinking it was fantasy. But in fact, that the market has delivered in a big way. Um, and yes, there's going to be lumps and bumps and roadblocks on the way. But I think overall, it's a very bright picture. And, and, and you know, we should be proud of the way that things have developed. Yes, indeed. I, I agree with you. And uh, let me join in thanking. Uh, beside the pharmaceutical companies, I think we should thank all the researchers and scientists that every day indeed. go to work. And they do an amazing an amazing job, not just for the pandemic or against the pandemic, but you know, just to improve the quality of our life and to cure us. Uh, we tend to accuse pharmaceutical companies of big evil. Maybe they are, but inside there, there are thousands and thousands of people that do a tremendous, a tremendous job. And often when we accuse and attack uh, uh, patent rights, we often forget about uh, about these people and it's not rhetoric. Uh, Keith, I'm coming to you because one of the questions that I made to Barbara anticipating this uh, second round uh, is about the patent. And it's not about the, the, the driving license, it's about the patent that the European Union, the US and many other countries would like to introduce uh, as a proof of not being affected by the virus or being vaccinated. What is your opinion on this? Do we need a patent that tells us if we are vaccinated or not? Um, well, to I, travel, I, to travel. Yeah, I mean, can, can I, I'll, I'm going to do a typical thing that I'm not a politician, what a politician, I want, I'm, I want to comment on something else first. I agree with, totally with Philip, because uh, the fact of the matter is, if there was an IP, we'd be in a Soviet Union situation where be, nothing would be produced. Either it'd be produced very late, by which there are hundreds of thousands of people dead, or you wouldn't have it even in the first place. So, so I'd just like to add that into it. That's the time factor, the, the competition of the 12 that Philip has mentioned. They're, they're, they're really racing to get their product to market, and that's keeping uh, price under control. Of course, uh, in, in, in the AstraZeneca case, the government did this deal where they said, we'll give you this 18 million, to speed it up. We put alongside it the regulator to make sure it's done fast. The condition is we don't expect you to make a profit because we want this to be available to, to poor countries as well. That was a, a consequence of uh, the way the market works. Um, and your, your, your point about vaccine passports, I, I think that's a, 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 that's a very difficult uh, question for, for libertarians. Fundamentally, I don't like the sound of it. Uh, you know, we don't have identity cards in the UK. We don't like the sound of someone saying, uh, you can't do something unless you produce a piece of paper. We don't like that. On the other hand, uh, there, there, you know, if you go to a gentleman's club in London, they may say, I'm, I'm sorry, Pietro, you can't come in. You, you haven't got a tie. You know, so, that, so there's the free market right to say, I set the conditions of how you enter my country or how you enter my shop or whatever. If it comes from that, uh, that free approach, I, I have less reservations about it. But if it's a government saying everyone must carry this piece of paper, uh, just like they had regional passports in the Soviet Union, and you, you can't go from one region to the other region unless you produce your passport. I'm totally against it. So it's a delicate matter. Hopefully um, we'll end up fairly soon with herd immunity and then therefore uh, these people will stop asking for them. Even if, uh, even if the madmen in Brussels say we should all have it, people will stop asking for it. Can you imagine, you know, you're an Italian. Can you imagine, they just stop, they forget it, come in, have a coffee, you know, but... Uh, but when people are afraid and, um, and they, they, they feel the right to make sure that they're protected, I suppose on a voluntary basis, it may be acceptable. Thank you so much, Keith. And I apologize me, you correctly call it a passport. I call it a patent because in Italian, we translate that as a patent, as a driving license patent. <laughs> so it was my mistake translating from the Italian. I'm sorry, I'm very ashamed today. We have two pure English speaker here, Keith and, and Philip, of course, and my, my poor English, you know, is, uh, is, uh, is feeling really much ashamed. Uh, but Barbara, better than my you know, you even, uh, even you're Italian, but this is it. No, better than my Italian. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Unfortunately, it's a debate in English, and when you get two people from the UK, then it's really bad. Uh, but I will protect my Italian with my IP. Barbara, back to you because we're we're turning to an end. Uh, I want to turn the same question when it comes to the passport. Uh, uh, the kid said correctly, and I agree totally with what uh, what he presented here. Is a delicate matter, uh, and there is also one point that. Uh, somebody's, uh, you know, even the industry, the trade association here in Italy said we need a, a passport for companies to go back and open, or we need a passport to go back to the gym. When actually the only people that could go back to the gym or to work were the old people that got the vaccine. So there was that kind of paradox in this. Uh, I know in, in Oster you got this uh, some sort of the same discussion. Uh, being a libertarian, a libertarian woman, what is your position on this? And this is, this is a truly difficult uh, point, especially coming from a libertarian point of view, because you, you want your freedom, you want your own decision, and you want uh, to carry a passport or not. It should be your choice. But, you know, seeing the consequences, uh, first of all, uh, there are, it's a question of data protection. And this is something that nobody discusses all of a sudden. But, you know, you are tracked, you are traced, um, do I want this? I mean, it's my individual choice whether I allow this to be done or not. But, you know, government says no. So then we have government civilians and discrimination to those who do not want to, or to, who have not been able to be vaccined already. So this is a discrimin discrim discriminatory on the other hand. And of course, you know, having to have a passport with you simply when you want to go to a restaurant has little to do with freedom at all. Um, and actually, if you look at it from, from this perspective, this should be re uh, rejected. So now as an economist say, this is on the one hand as a libertarian and on the other hand, when you look at, at our practical lives, we just gave in because we want to travel. I mean, it's, it is not the way that the airline decides. I only take those who are vaccinated and who have a passport. It says, if you want to travel, you have to be vaccinated. If the airline had the choice or if the restaurant had the choice to let those people in who they want, then it's fine. But you know, it's top down decision. So uh, it's, a little, it's, it's tricky. You know, we are losing yeah. our individual democratic freedoms. Uh, our cities, our, you know, our freedoms as citizens. So um, uh, this will be a very difficult question. So there will not be a new normal. We will, even if we are vaccinated, we will not get to normal because this will constantly um, reduce our individual freedom. It will uh, distort markets. And uh, of course it will create new regulation, big government. And as we just saw, a lot of centralization and central plant uh, authority. Yes, Barbara, um, uh, we, we really have one minute to go, but uh, since it's been a very vi vibrant, a very, I would say, calm, vibrant and meaningful debate, uh, and it's a smart brevity, as we know, 45 minutes, and that's what we want to deliver. This event is being recorded. You can watch as many times as you want, but just very quick remarks. Keith, I want to start with you to end. And, and, and to lead our discussion to the, to the end. Uh, it's a very broad question, but it, it comes to my mind almost every day. Before going to bed, I think about it. Uh, and it's not a general question, what have we learned uh, from this pandemic? But when it comes to vaccines, when it comes to IP, when it comes to the passport, uh, Barbara said, we're not going back to normal. Do you agree, Keith, that we're not going back to normal and we learned something else or something new? Or we learn that we are going back to what you define as sort of Soviet system where we getting more control, that we are more afraid of our freedom? Well, I, I certainly hope that we, we, we get what, what is being called a new normal so that the certain benefits like this meeting that we're having uh, uh, allow us to have meetings more frequently and, and, and beneficially. Uh, I don't want the new normal to, to bring negatives. Um, I wanted to only be full of positives. 
just thinking about Barbara saying about the airlines, for example, a free market would end up with a situation where it said, would you like to go on an airplane where you have to produce a vaccine certificate? Or would you like to go on a cheaper airline where you don't have to produce a vaccine certificate? Would you like to go on an airline which allows you to cancel if uh, COVID flares up and you get your money back? Or do you want to take a chance? That's how the market would work, not the top down, which Barbara fears and which I fear too because that is the Soviet route. And, and the Soviet route ended up producing no new vaccines ever, nothing. So- uh, Well, actually we they did the one. Benefits. <laughs> we want to take the benefits. They did one, I'm not sure whether it works or not, but Philip, thanks Keith, very much. Philip, I'm coming back to you for the last remarks. Uh, what have we learned? And are we going, as Keith said, to a new normal or it's going to be a worrying normal? What do you think? Um, well, I think people have been at home for so long, um, they're sick of it and they want to get back to traveling and restaurants and so forth. Although corporate budgets may say, well, no, no more travel for the time being. Um, I think those budget holders themselves have families and are sick of being at home. So I think maybe things will just ping back. Actually, the, the head of Ryanair, who Michael O'Leary, who generally has predicted trends in travel quite well, uh, has stuck his neck out and said that travel will return to normal by the end of next year um and he's you know spent money on that wager through investing in his fleet um other major airlines disagree so let's see who's who's um who's correct my my money's on michael o'leary i think <laughs> well with michael we have to pay for everything for our seat for our <laughs> beer for our snacks barbara last uh, remark to you well, as Austrian economists, we always believe in the in, in opportunities and in and in innovation and in new ideas and in competition. So uh, we should think about it positively, hope for the best, and try to eliminate uh, the worst restriction restrictions that we see. So yeah. positive end. Absolutely. And thank you, thank you, Keith, so much for being here with us and taking your time, Philip. And Barbara and to all the friends that were here on Zoom and the, the one that were on Facebook following us. This event is being recorded, will be made available on the Austrian Economic Center uh, website and you can download and use it uh, whenever you want. Well, I agree Keith, with what you said that, uh, you know, we got in this new normal, this technology that is bringing us together, allowing us to work together. But, you know, if we were meeting for real, maybe we were few people, but now I'm sure Philip, you, Keith, and Barbara were offering me a beer or a glass of wine. So that's what I miss. And hopefully <laughs> we will get together very soon again. And after talking about uh, liberalism, libertarianism, freedom, Soviet Union, you know, we all get together and, and drink and eat together. It and was this famous, famous point, sorry, Barbara. I have a yeah. last word. The Free Market Roadshow on IP in Stockholm next week. Don't forget. And join we'll us. Follow. May, we'll follow. Thank May 3rd, you. We'll 5 follow. p.m. We'll follow. Let me end with this Roman poet that he said, all the families were arguing in Rome, you know, typical Roma attitude. They were arguing and fighting, but when food was ready on the table, they all sat down and ate it quietly. So that's what we're <laughs> going to do tonight on the internet, though. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much, everybody, and to the team, Victoria, Martin, and Fritz for putting this together, and to my team back in Rome. So enjoy your evening and see you next month on a Thursday again. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.